Thank you, Cassidy, for that introduction and Rachel for that beautiful welcome message. I am so happy to be here today um, coming from my New York City teeny tiny studio apartment. Uh, let's see. As was mentioned, my name is Uriah Mastavez. I am an engineering manager over at the New York Times, and I'm so excited to kick things off today. And I want to start off by answering a question first. What is accessibility? Uh, at the heart of it, web accessibility means websites, tools, and technologies that are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. Now, why should that matter to us? And there are actually several reasons why accessibility should be a priority for us as engineers. Of course, there are monetary and legal reasons for why we should care about accessibility in our day to day. But I want to focus on one reason in particular, because it's the one that resonates most with me, and I hope it will resonate with you as well. As engineers, we have a lot of power in shaping the impact we have on our users at scale. All of us work at very different companies and across a multitude of industries. And that means that we're building products for a bunch of different users, including those with disabilities. And when we don't build our apps and websites accessibly, we can make it hard or sometimes even impossible for some people to use them. So when we make seemingly small mistakes, like posting a meme without alternative text, meaning that a screen reader user won't be able to laugh along with us, or we can make detrimental mistakes, like building out an inaccessible checkout flow that makes it impossible for some users to buy groceries online. And in a time like this, I'm sure we can all imagine what that must feel like and what effects that can have on a person's life. We shouldn't be the ones that are gatekeeping and limiting access to the web. But when we aren't mindful of the code that we're writing and the users that are impacted by it, a lot of times that can be the result. So keeping the web universal and inclusive means that we have to make our websites accessible. And to do that, we should be starting at the foundation. Components are one of the things that make React so powerful. They allow us to package up functionality and UI and utilize them in various parts of our code bases. They really are the building blocks of our apps and our websites. And if the blocks are reliable and well-built, it stands to reason that the apps will be too. So if we designed and developed the building blocks to be accessible, then maybe we can start making some really significant progress in building out fully accessible websites that work for everyone. Unfortunately, that is a lot easier said than it is done. When I first started off learning accessibility concepts, one of the hardest things uh, to figure out was how I could take the components that I'd built dozens of times over and over again and uncover the requirements needed to make them accessible. And naturally, I thought that turning to the documentation would help clear up a lot of my confusion. But instead, I was hit with this. A huge wall of text, hundreds of links that go to even more documentation, documentation pages, and dozens of concepts that I didn't even know I didn't know. But that didn't get me off the hook, right? I couldn't just brush accessibility under the rug. Instead, I had to be more strategic about how I was approaching the documentation. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to share my too long, didn't read approach to building accessible components and how we can quickly identify the, quick, uh, the critical requirements necessary by going off of the documentation. And I've broken it down into three easy parts. We're first going to talk about semantic HTML and how we should be leveraging that whenever possible to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to our accessibility support. We'll then discuss how we can identify ARIA attributes that we need to add to those HTML elements when semantic HTML isn't exactly enough to build out the support that we need. And then we'll discuss 
managing keyboard navigation for users that don't interact with the web using a mouse. Now, you probably already noticed I have the word easy in quotes, and that's because there is a pretty significant caveat to all of this. It takes a good amount of time to build up our understanding of accessibility. It's not a silver bullet, uh, silver bullet approach, and these aren't life hacks or even the only things that we need to consider when we're building out accessibility support. But I really do hope that by narrowing things down, it's going to make it easier and faster for us to ramp up and target exactly what it is that we need to get up and running in our accessible components. And with that, let's start off with semantic HTML. Luckily for us, HTML was fundamentally designed and developed to be accessible. And that means that we can rely on semantic HTML elements to do a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, to do a lot of the heavy lifting when we're building out our components. What we really need to understand is that assistive technologies are truly just software and hardware, and they will only understand the code that we write. They won't be able to understand our good intentions, and they won't really be able to know the context on the page. So we really do have to speak their language, and semantic HTML is part of that language. <clears throat> now, I know that a lot of us are guilty of this. I certainly have been guilty of this many times in my career. We need to build a button, and in order to skip a couple of steps in styling that button, we decide that we're going to be using a div. It just makes it easier in the CSS to not have to override a bunch of styling. Unfortunately for us, divs have absolutely no semantic meaning, which means that assistive technologies like a screen reader will have no idea what this element is or that it even exists. And on top of that, keyboard-only users won't be able to interact with it because divs are not interactive by default. Luckily, there is an HTML element that represents a button. It's called the button element. And this is an element that will be completely understood by assistive technologies, and they'll be able to know how to interact with it, as well as uh, including keyboard support out of the box. And again, that's because this element was built with accessibility in mind. And there are over 100 different HTML elements, and almost all of them have some semantic meaning that we can leverage. The only two elements that I could find in my digging that had absolutely no semantic meaning were div and span. And somehow, those are the two elements that get used most frequently when we're building out our components. So we really do have to get into the habit of using the tools that we have available to us. It's just easier to rely on semantic HTML than to try and build in accessibility support after the fact. And to illustrate that, let's take a look at two different button components. On the left, I have a button component that uses a div element. And on the right, I have a button component that uses the HTML button element. Notice how many more lines of code it takes on the left to make our div button fully accessible, whereas on the right, our HTML button just works accessibly out of the box because that is what it was designed and developed to do. Again, these elements were built with accessibility in mind, and we need to start leveraging them in the components that we build whenever we can in order to make our lives easier. But of course, semantic HTML cannot solve all of our accessibility problems. Yes, there are over 100 HTML elements, many of them with semantic meaning, but that, doesn't always, that isn't always enough when we're building out our more complex components. For example, something like this doesn't exist in HTML. I have a nav bar with a couple of uh, drop-down menu items. On my wish list of elements that I wish existed in HTML would be the dropdown and dropdown list elements. And these are elements whose semantic meaning and behavior is managed entirely by the browser. And because they're native H because they would be native HTML elements, that means they would also be accessible out of the box. But of course, that's not the world that we live in, right? <clears throat> 
Instead, we make all of the magic happen with CSS and JavaScript so that we can make this component behave like a drop down, like a drop down menu should. That means that this as it's written is not going to be accessible because no assistive technology can identify that this menu bar is actually a nav bar with drop down menu items. So what we need here is a way to assign additional semantic meaning to our grouping of our grouping of elements in more complex components so that assistive technologies can know how to work with them. And that's where aria attributes come in handy. ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and they are a set of HTML attributes that help define and enhance the semantics of our element, of our elements and our components. And we use them so that our components can be better understood by assistive technologies whenever they have more dynamic or complex behaviors involved. ARIA attributes are broken up into three different categories. We have roles, which help define the type of element or component that we're building, and then states and properties, which are supportive attributes that provide a little bit more detail to our roles. We can combine roles with states and properties to help properly communicate to assistive technologies what our component is, how it behaves, and how we can interact with it. And there are a lot of different attributes that we can use. So sometimes it can be hard to know which combinations of attributes to use in which components that we're building. But luckily, there's a really helpful resource that we can use called the Why ARIA Authoring Practices document. That's a mouthful to say. And this is a document that helps, uh, that helps outline best practices and guidelines for how to use ARIA attributes to build out dynamic and complex user experiences in an accessible way. The Why ARIA Authoring Practices documentation contains a list of common components and design patterns that we're all familiar with. Things like alerts, checkboxes, modals, and a handful of others. And it has details on which ARIA roles, states, and property attributes are either required or available for us to, for each one of these components. And we can use these to make sure that our, um, our different components can work with assistive technologies. Another useful thing in the Y ARIA documentation is uh, a list of different code samples in HTML, CSS, and vanilla JavaScript. And I really like to use these so that I can refer to them when I'm building out my React components and get a sense of what the component logic is. And then I use that I use that code sample to translate it over to React and have a bit of a head start when I'm building out my components. Now, before digging into ARIA any further, I do want to issue a very quick warning. A general rule of thumb for ARIA is the best ARIA is no ARIA at all. And what that means is, if there are HTML elements that support what you're trying to do, definitely use those instead of using ARIA. And if you don't know if your ARIA setup is correct, better not to use it at all. ARIA is incredibly powerful because it overrides all of the semantic meaning for the elements that they're applied to. So if they're used incorrectly, that can essentially render your components completely useless to assistive technology and create a really terrible user experience. But when we leverage ARIA in the appropriate way, we can help add the additional accessibility support necessary for our users so that they can be able to interact with dynamic, uh, with the dynamic and complex components that we're building. All right, now that, that's out of the way. So let's take a look at uh, what we can do with ARIA by going back to our button component. The Why ARIA documentation includes a write-up for how to build an accessible button from scratch. And I know I already said that we should always try to use semantic HTML elements when they're available to us. But the reality is that sometimes we do actually need to build a button from scratch. So when we need to do that, we want to make sure that we're doing it accessibly. The design patterns doc includes a write-up of roles, states, and properties for making an accessible button. So let's step through and work 
and work out what that would look like for us. First thing on the list is our component needs an ARIA role attribute, and that role attribute needs to be set to button. And we're going to add this so that assistive technologies can identify this plain div as a button. Back to our button example from before. And we're going to go ahead and add in our ARIA role attribute and set that to button. And again, now a screen reader, something like a screen reader, will be able to announce that this, is, this element is a button, and a user will know that they can interact with it in some way. We also need to make sure that our button has an accessible label. Now, according to the docs, by default, the accessible name of a button can be derived by any text content that is inside of a button. So here in my button on the screen, a screen reader would announce this as button submit. And that's because the word submit is inside of our button. But sometimes the content inside of our button isn't screen reader or user friendly. So here I have an emoji inside of my button because who doesn't love a good emoji? And in this case, a screen reader would announce this as waving hand button. And that gives our user no indication of what this button does whatsoever, which of course makes for not the best user experience. So this is, a, this is the case where we would want to override what the screen reader announces, and we can do that by setting an accessible label in our button. So what we want to do is pass in an accessible label prop into my component. And then if my accessible label is not null, then I want to be able to render the aria label attribute and set that equal to the accessible label that I've passed in. But notice that I'm not just setting it, setting my accessible label to an empty string. We have to remember that ARIA attributes take precedence on the elements that they're applied to. So even if this button does have text content in it, if my ARIA label is present, then that's, that is what my screen reader is going to announce. So if my ARIA label is present and it's sent to an empty string, my screen reader is just going to announce this as button with no other context around what this is. And again, this is giving no indication about what this button does, and the user is going to be left very confused. So make sure we're using our ARIA attributes responsibly in this way. The last thing we want to do for making our button element, our button component accessible is to signal when assistive signal to assistive technologies when a button is inactive. We can do that by setting the ARIA disabled state attribute and making sure it's set to either true or false. Here, whoops, here I have my is disabled prop that I'm passing into my component. And I'm going to be setting that equal to my ARIA disabled state attribute. And now a user can know when a button is active or inactive because a screen, something like a screen reader is going to be able to announce it. Now, there are a couple of other points in the documentation around additional ARIA attributes that we can add to our button. But for the time being, this is really all we need for a simple button. So let's just go ahead and recap what we know so far. ARIA attributes help define and enhance the semantics of our complex and dynamic components in order to make them more accessible. ARIA roles identify the kind of component that uh, identify the kind of component to our assistive technologies. And ARIA states and properties can be used by their supported roles to help describe the component throughout its lifecycle. And there are many different roles, states, and properties that we can use. So it's great to turn to the Y ARIA documentation to help us decipher the combinations we need in order to make our components accessible. And remember, a general rule of thumb is the best ARIA is no ARIA at all. Make sure you're using semantic HTML elements whenever it's appropriate. And if you're not sure if you have the right combination of ARIA attributes, it's best to leave them out entirely. And now that we know how to make assistive technologies understand our components, we can talk about how our users can interact with our components accessibly. 
Uh, we can do that by talking about keyboard navigation. And we have to understand that not everyone uses a mouse as their primary device for navigation on the web. Some users rely on keyboards or some kind of assistive technology that more or less maps to keyboard interactions. And that means that we have to be really mindful uh, to make sure that our components have keyboard support built in. We need to consider how our user is going to be able to interact with our components using just a keyboard. And unless we're relying solely on semantic HTML elements, we are entirely responsible for managing our keyboard navigation. Different components require different keyboard support. And the Y ARIA documentation, again, is a great place to go to to clearly spell out the expected support for many different components and design patterns. They have an entire section that explains how a component can be interacted with using only a keyboard. So let's go back to our div button component and work through the documentation to figure out how we can build in keyboard navigation support. We already know that our div element is not interactive by default. So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we can tab to it and that it can gain keyboard focus. And we can do that by adding the tab index attribute to our button and setting it equal to zero. And this is going to allow our div to gain keyboard focus whenever a user reaches it in the natural tab order. According to the docs, once a button has focus, we can interact with it using the space and enter keys. And these are the keys are going to these are the keys that are going to activate our button when a key is pressed. In our button, we are passing in an activate function. And this gets called when our on-click event fires. But we also need a way to trigger our activate function when the space or enter key is pressed, as we know. So we're going to add an on-key press uh, event listener. And the on-key press event handler is going to check to make sure that the space or enter key are pressed whenever it's called. And if the space or enter key were pressed, then we're going to go ahead and run that same activate function that we passed to our on-click event. And now we have a very simple div button that is keyboard accessible. We made sure that our button could be interacted with by adding, the, by adding it to the natural tab order using tab index. And we assigned an on key press event handler so that we could listen to when the space and enter key should be activating our button. Now, this was a very simple example of keyboard navigation for a single button. But there are a couple of other considerations that we have to make in general when we're building out our component keyboard navigation. First thing we want to make sure is uh, that we that our user knows when our, where our keyboard focus is at all times. That means that we should always have some kind of visible indicator for which elements currently has focus. And at the very least, that means that we should never eliminate or change the focus outline on active elements. Usually the focus outline by default in the browser is a blue outline around buttons or other interactive elements. And at some point, there will be someone that's going to ask you if you can get rid of that ugly blue outline. And the answer should always be no, because it's necessary for allowing users to know where their keyboard focus is and to make sure that they are able to navigate using a keyboard. And on top of making sure that our user always knows where keyboard focus is, we have to make sure that we're creating a predictable tab order so that users can more or less know where their focus will go when they tab to the next or the previous elements. Another thing we need to make sure that we're managing is uh, making sure that we're persisting keyboard focus between interaction events. We've all built a modal or two or 10, um, but I don't think many of us, myself included, have built them accessibly. So if we ask ourselves, how would we build a modal in React? 
a lot of us would probably answer by rendering and unmounting our component modal based on some kind of state. And this is where we have to be mindful of it. What happens to focus when my component gets rendered onto the page? And then what happens to keyboard focus when my components unmount? In this example, I, uh, I activate my modal by pressing the uh, keyboard, by pressing the button using the keyboard. When my modal opens, keyboard focus switches into the interactive elements inside of the modal. And when my modal closes, keyboard focus has to return to the original activator button. Keyboard focus has to be persistent and predictable throughout component life cycles. And that is something that we're gonna have to manage ourselves when we're building out more complex and dynamic behavior in our applications. And that's about it for keyboard navigation. So let's do a really quick recap. We know that all of our components have to have keyboard, navig uh, keyboard support. And this means that we need to map out how a user would navigate our component using only a keyboard. We have to make sure that non-interactive elements can gain keyboard fo focus using the tab index attribute. And we can use the Y ARIA documents to figure out which interactions we have to build in in order for our component to respond to certain key presses. And we have to make sure that we're ensuring our user knows where their keyboard focus is and that it persists throughout the component lifecycle. And those are the three easy parts to uh, building out accessible components. So let's just very quickly wrap up. We have three things that we should always be keeping in mind when we're building our components. We have semantic HTML that we want to be using whenever possible, and this is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to accessibility support. But when semantic HTML elements don't do exactly what we need them to, we have to make sure that we're identifying the ARIA attributes that we need in order to uh, build in a bit more complex and build in a bit more complexity, and make sure that we're supporting our dynamic components in an accessible way. But of course, remember, no ARIA is the best ARIA. So use it responsibly or don't use it at all. Lastly, we have to manage our keyboard navigation because again, some users can't use a mouse and rely solely on keyboards. So make sure that keyboard support is included in your accessible components. And we were able to uncover all of the places, all of the places that the Y ARIA documentation uh, covers these three different topics. Um, and we can make sure to turn to it whenever we're feeling a bit lost or aren't entirely sure where to get started. And again, I want to reiterate that these are just techniques to hopefully make building accessible components a little bit easier. They're not the only things that we have to consider, and actually there are a lot of other factors that we have to weigh. Things like making sure that our visual design is accessible. Do we meet the requirements for color contrast? And are we making sure that we are considering folks with different visual impairments during our design phases? What if we have a single page application? How does navigation between pages using something like React Router affect screen readers and keyboard navigation? And are we writing unit integration and end-to-end -end tests that check to make sure that we aren't breaking accessibility support in our components every time we make a change? Lastly, but most importantly, are we considering our users? Sometimes as engineers, it's hard for us to remember that we are not our users and what works for us or what we think makes the most sense to us may not actually be what the user needs. I hope that the topics we covered today will give you a better understanding of what your user needs. And now that you have the tools and the knowledge for building out accessible components, you can put it all together to build accessible websites and apps. And ultimately, you can use that to help make the web an open and inclusive place for everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for the conference organizers for putting together this amazing event come hang out on uh, the Discord channel to ask questions or just to chat with each other and make sure to stick around for the incredible day that we have ahead. Thank you.